Hello and welcome. I'm Imran Garda sitting in for Riz Khan. Well, Haiti's deepening political crisis pushed the fragile nation further into disarray. As the country prepares for a presidential runoff vote in March, thousands are protesting against a three-month extension to outgoing President René Préval's term. Complicating matters is the possible return of a controversial former leader. This week, Haiti issued a diplomatic passport for ex-president Jean-Bertrand Aristide. He has been in exile after being forced from power in a violent 2004 rebellion. His arrival would represent a second twist to Haiti's ongoing political drama. Ousted dictator Jean-Claude Duvalier touched down in Haiti three weeks ago, saying he was seeking reconciliation. Well, today we ask, how will the latest developments affect Haiti's troubled democratic process? Remember, you can call in with your comments and questions. You can also send us an email or SMS on the show. Well, joining us to discuss these issues are Harry Fouché, the former Consul General of Haiti in New York. Uh, Fouché is currently Chairman of the Consortium for Haitian Empowerment, and he joins us from Chicago. And joining me here in the studio is Mark Weisbrot. He's co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research an economic think tank based here in Washington, D.C. Thanks a lot for joining us, uh, uh, both you gentlemen. And earlier, I also spoke to OAS Secretary General uh, Jose Miguel Insulza, and we'll be uh, listening to some of what, I had, uh, what he had to say to me a little bit later on. First of all, uh, Mark, uh, do you think that this upcoming runoff vote is pointless? Well, I don't see how you're going to get a legitimate result out of this. Uh, first of all, three-quarters of the electorate didn't vote in the first round of the election. And that's partly because the most popular political party was arbitrarily excluded. It's as if you were to exclude the Democrats in the United States. Then to make it worse than that, uh, the United States government, using the OAS as a political instrument, forced the government of Haiti to change the results of the first round of the election, leaving, uh, eliminating the government's candidate and leaving two uh, right-wing candidates in the race, uh, candidates who combined got about 11 percent of the registered voters to vote for them. So uh, given all this, I think it's very hard to see how you get a legitimate government out and of this. Would the United States really threaten sanctions and the, and the withdrawing of aid in order for, for Haiti to instate its preferred candidate? Well, they did. I mean, Susan Rice made uh, remarks in front of the uh, United Nations, which all of the newspapers, including the Miami Herald and New York Times, everyone interpreted Associated Press as uh, a threat. Now, it's true that uh, Hillary Clinton, you know, said they weren't threatening them, but they also canceled the visas of various government officials. They used every possible pressure to force uh, the government of Haiti to accept this change of result, a very unprecedented thing, by the way, to change the result for any electoral authority, much mm -hmm. less uh, a force outside the country, to actually change the result of an election without a recount. And you know, it's not even clear that uh, they have a legal decision, because now it turns out that four out of the eight members of Haiti's Provisional Electoral Council did not, uh, in fact, sign off on uh, accepting this change of result and so they don't the law requires a majority so as we speak right now there's some legal limbo as to whether or not they even have okay. uh, candidates for the second round okay let's get harry fouché's thoughts mr fouché do you agree with mark that this runoff election is nothing more than a sham because the electoral council was pressured into choosing the candidates preferred by the united states well, indeed, uh, the uh, election was a sham. Uh, the, the, the day of, of November 2010 was a day of infamy for us in Haiti. We regarded it as, uh, as an insult because, uh, uh, as was alluded to earlier, uh, the majority of the Haitian people could not and were not able to vote that day. And by noon, the uh, 12 of the uh, candidates uh, in the balloting had asked for it to be canceled including the two people that are now in the runoff. They were also part of the group asking for the cancellation of the, of the voting. And lo and behold, through pressure or through some sweetheart deals, they came back and now they are in the race. 
But in addition to the uh, four council members that you mentioned who did not sign for the uh, certification of the vote, the, we just heard uh, recently, just a few, few minutes ago, that uh, Michel Martelly has said he will not participate in the second round unless the president of the Electoral Council and the director general of the Electoral Council, unless they were both fired. He also is asking for three ministers from the current government to be removed from office. The Justice Minister Paul Denis, the uh, Social Affairs Minister Germain, and then the, uh, the Interior Minister Bien-Aimé. So he's asking for these three people to be fired and also the, the Board of Election President and the Board of Election Director General. So okay. it's, uh, nothing is certain. Okay, as far that's, as what that's, is going to that's an interesting development regarding Martelly. We'll have to follow up uh, on that indeed. I mean, uh, pretty significant. Now, obviously, the OAS has been integral uh, to all of this, called in by the Haitian government and the Electoral Council to kind of oversee the process. Earlier in the day, just uh, down the road from us, I spoke to the OAS Secretary General, Jose Miguel, in Solz. I asked him why it took so much pressure for so long from so many people for the Haitian Electoral Council and the leaders to finally endorse the OAS recommendations? I First, I think that uh, there was concern about the, uh, the results, because the results were delivered, and there was a problem with this, the leaking of the results and all that, which was really also creating a lot of uh, a situation of mistrust. I, I very much regret that that happened. It was really, I, I don't know who, who, who did it, but it was a very, a very, a very a negative action. So there was a uh, suspicion. I mean, there was a lot of suspicion going, coming and going, and a lot of things were said. But I would say that uh, I've been to Haiti long, a lot of times, and uh, I don't think that there were too many threats because threats don't really work in, in Haiti. They, 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 can, they can really, in the in the end, uh, go go back against you. Mark Weisbrot, uh, the OAS Secretary General, said, "I don't think there were too many threats." Threats don't work in Haiti. You obviously disagree with him. Oh, it's obvious that they were threats. These were public. These were public threats from the United States government, from the French government. They're all over the media. Uh, so there's no doubt about that. And I think it's, it's, it's you know, frankly, it's kind of shameful that uh, Secretary Insulsa is uh, allowing the OAS to be used as an instrument uh, not only of U.S. foreign policy, which it's not supposed to be, but the worst, most anti-democratic kind of uh, foreign policy that this country has to offer in the region. So it's really quite terrible. And I don't, as I said, I, I don't think it's good for Haiti. It's not good for anybody because you're not going to get a legitimate government this way. They should have simply supported, uh, drawn uh, the logical conclusion from their own report, which would have been to rerun the elections. Okay, let's get Harry Fouché's comment on what you just heard indeed, there from the OAS uh, Secretary General. Indeed, uh, Iman, I think on the 28th of November, December, tw uh, the 28th of November 2010, uh, I did call for the uh, cancellation of the election, and I think that's what should have been done because the process was so flawed, it was difficult to, uh, to fix it. And it's, it's also kind of paradoxical that the OAS was the first body, international body, to come out and said the election was fine uh, through its spokesperson, Colin Grinderson, in Port-au-Prince. And then that same OAS came back later on to fix what was wrong with the election. So it, it's, it's a game. It's a, it's a nasty game. And we don't think the Haitian people deserve that. Uh, the election should have been scrapped and new elections called for uh, to enable the Haitian people's voices to be heard. Okay, let's listen to what uh, Jose Miguel Insulza had to say about the possible imminent return of Jean Bertrand Aristide. I think it does have a lot of influence. There's a lot of influence in Haiti. He has a lot of followers. I think that the, 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 the fact that uh, that many people follow him is, it makes it, it, it's, uh, it, make it makes it uh, 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 necessary to consider his presence if, if he comes. Now, fascinating uh, stuff that he, he, he doesn't actually uh, diminish the possible influence of Jean Bertrand uh, Aristide, does he, the OAS uh, Secretary General? I mean, was this Rene Preval's joker card that he played to everybody that pressured him? Um, to uh, kick Jude Salasen out of 
uh, the presidential race. Was Aristide the special joker card? Well, I don't think it, this is the law. I mean, Aristide has the right to return to the country. He's a Haitian citizen. And it's unfortunate, too, that the OAS is not supporting international law here either. In this case, uh, in term, they should have, for the last seven years, the United States has worked illegally uh, to keep uh, President Aristide out of his own country. And of course, they overthrew him in 2004. It was a four-year effort where they cut off aid to the country and destroyed the economy and at the same time pumped in many millions of dollars into an opposition including uh, convicted murderers and, and uh, you know armed uh, rebels in order to overthrow that government and they took him out of the country on a plane and by the way we were talking about threats they threatened according to multiple reports uh, in the press uh, from various witnesses, they have threatened Preval uh, uh, this time mm -hmm. with doing the same thing, with flying him out of the country on a plane. So, uh, uh, you know, this is what's wrong here. This is the problem. People talk about Haiti having a failed state. It's a failed state but because the United States has repeatedly destroyed the state in uh, Haiti. But isn't there a bit of a r uh, romanticization about Aristide in, in many ways because, you know, he was famed for creating the, the Chimeras, um uh, notoriously cracking down on dissent. Uh, people talk about you know, Duvalier's uh, gangs, if you like. There were similar accusations towards uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Would the return of Aristide not create violence on the streets? Well, see, this is a false equivalence that was part, you know, again, the United States poured many, many millions, tens of millions of dollars into this effort to uh, demonize and then overthrow Aristide. So this idea that uh, Aristide had some kind of a violent government. He actually eliminated more than 90 or 95 percent of the political violence in the country, uh, first and foremost by getting rid of the Haitian army, which was the main source of violence. Mm. So this kind of uh, false equivalence between Aristide and other uh, violent, actually violent rulers mm. in Haiti is something that was really uh, uh, manufactured in the press. Well, it is arguably a false uh, equivalence. Let me ask Harry Fouché in uh, Chicago. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tee up my question with uh, dipping into our inbox here and one of the many emails that have come through. This one from uh, Ivianake Ekperi from Nigeria. And uh, Ivianake Ekperi says, why recycle a leader who did more harm than good? Mr. Aristide needs to be kept far away if progress is to come to Haiti. What do you think, Harry Fouché? Well, unfortunately, the, uh, your listener in uh, Mr. Uh, Akperi in Nigeria is not informed about what's happening in Haiti. Mr. Aristide uh, is entitled to return to Haiti under the Haiti Constitution. And uh, remember now, he was overthrown twice. And on both occasions, the U.S. played a role in his overthrowing. And we also have to remember that uh, all these things are playing as a result of the fraudulent elections that took place on no November 28. When Duvalier returned with the acquiescence of the Haitian government, this was a distraction put out by the Haitian government so they could carry on with the fraudulent election. But they, they did not expect people to actually rise up and demand that Mr. Aristide, President Aristide, be returned to the country. So this is what has happened now. And uh, Mr. Aristide uh, was issued his uh, passport, which is rightfully his to, to, to ask for. And uh, he should be returning to his country. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, pretending that he's going to be uh, a threat, he's going to be uh, uh, causing uprising, that is nonsense. You know, he, he's, he's entitled to be in his own country, and uh, no one in Washington or Paris or, or in Ottawa should decide whether or not a Haitian citizen is entitled to be at his house. M Mark Weisbrot, do you foresee any possible uh, moves from the U.S. and others to maybe stop him actually returning into the country. I know you, you, you touched on it a little bit, but what's the likelihood of that? I mean, let me dip into the inbox again. Uh, this one from Francois Prinsloo via Facebook. And Francois Prinsloo says, considering the U.S.'s role in forcing him to exile, what would America's reaction be in case of Aristide's return? What's the likelihood of the United States actually trying to stop him getting back to Haiti? Well, I don't think they can do it overtly uh, because it, it's, it's too embarrassing to them to say now, especially after Duvalier returns, and Duvalier has returned with a, a long-time 
uh, U.S. intelligence asset, uh, Louis Jod uh, Jodel Champlain, uh, Champlain as the head of his security. And then they tried to say that Aristide uh, can't come back. But you know that they're doing everything they can. I mean, Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, a week ago Sunday, uh, flew to Haiti after doing five uh, national television shows on Egypt in the midst of her worst foreign policy crisis ever, goes to Haiti uh, to put pressure on uh, President Preval, uh, first of all, to accept the change of result of their elections, but I think also uh, to, to force him uh, not to let Aristide back into the country. And so far, it seems like that pressure uh, did not work. Well, with a country like Haiti, there's uh, perpetually this discussion over democracy, over stability, or stability over democracy. Even I asked uh, Jose Miguel Insulza, the Secretary General of the OAS, what, uh, what he thinks Haiti needs, democracy or stability? Well, uh, I would say that uh, I understand, I understand the question because uh, I, I think that there is one thing that's lacking in, in Haiti. There's all those resources, all the money has come uh, in all the world, the, 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 the aid that comes from, from, from institutions that we still have to sort out to, to make it more efficient. But there's not enough uh, productive investment. I think that the lack of productive investment uh, is, is a problem in, in Haiti. It will probably increase when we deal with the, the, the largest, when they deal with the largest problem of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But investment, as you well know, comes with stability. Harry Fouché, not enough productive investment, says the OAS chief. What do you think? It's a vicious. It's a vicious circle, not enough productive investment. At the same time, there is uh, 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 actions that are destabilizing the country. What we need to have in Haiti is uh, uh, basically, you know, reshuffling the deck completely. A lot of these uh, policies uh, from the OAS, from the United Nations, from the United States, from the European Union, the French, those policies are not working. We need to rethink. We need to redo uh, what, uh, what we are doing in Haiti. Uh, Haiti definitely need to have uh, democracy. Uh, we cannot take one and not the other. Haiti certainly will need investments, but investments that are going to be productive for the people. It's not going to be investments that are, uh, you know, coming out of some uh, 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 genie box from somebody in, in Washington or in Paris. No, it's got to be productive investment. It's got to be real investment. It's got to be pro investment that are going to make a difference in the country. What do we need the most in Haiti right now? We need education. We need infrastructure. We need roads. We need water distribution. We need uh, health care. That's what we need. Yeah, but it's so interesting that you say that. Sorry to interrupt you, because there is a lot of money floating about. I mean, billions were pledged to Haiti, particularly after that devastating earthquake, yet only 5% of the rubble from the earthquake the has been cleared, according right. to uh, Oxfam. You still have, you know, the cholera uh, epidemic, and, right. and of course, millions still living, uh, over a million living right. in uh, 10 cities. What is it? Is it a lack of right. administration of the money, or is it downright the theft <clears throat> and corruption? The problem is at the donors, uh, uh, there is a problem with the donors' countries in themselves. Most of these monies that you're talking about have not been dispersed. 90% of the money really hasn't come to Haiti. You know, the money is sitting outside somewhere. I don't know who, where it, it is being managed. I know the uh, World Bank was supposed to be the, deposit, the depository for most of the money. But a lot of the promises made on uh, March 31st, 2010, never materialized. Of course, we do have a situation where money that were collected here in the U.S. from the Red Cross and a host of other charitable organizations, those monies were actually given by the people who, who, who disbursed them, but they were kept by the uh, agencies. For example, the Red Cross, as one of the biggest ones, uh, has said itself, it did not uh, uh, disburse all the monies that it got from the collection to help Haiti. So this is where the problem is. We need to rethink all these things. If money were collected for Haiti, then we need to find a way to make sure those monies are spent productively in Haiti. Certainly the Clinton Commission is not the answer. Certainly the, the Clinton Commission is not working. So mm -hmm. whatever new government is going to come out of Haiti, 
and uh, we'll have to rethink the, the Clinton Reconstruction Commission. I agree with you, 5% of the rubble have been removed. This is nonsense. How are you going to have reconstructions if you have rubble still thrown all over the country? Mm -hmm. So that's the problem that we are facing. Uh, there is a poverty industry that is in place in Haiti that is preventing progress from being made. And that's what we need to address. We need to address the real problems, and we need to address the poverty industry. And uh, Mark Weisbrot, do you believe that there's a parallel state that's actually running uh, among the NGOs in, in Haiti? Uh, Ricardo uh, Seitenfuss, the formerly the special representative of the OAS to Haiti, um, he'd spoken to my colleague Gabriel Elizondo not too long ago, and he said, quote, we cannot make Haiti a Disneyland of the NGOs. That's how he characterized it. Was he right? Well, yes, and I think that is one of the problems. As I said, the United States uh, has, and together with it, its allies, Canada and France, uh, they have several times already, in many ways, destroyed the Haitian government. Then it was hit even harder, as you know, by the earthquake and physically destroyed. Uh, and they haven't shown a lot of interest in building it uh, back up. Again, it's the problem is that they're more interested in power and control, mm -hmm. and you can see how they're fighting so hard. Uh, if they only put half of this effort into reconstructing Haiti that they've put into trying to control who runs the government, uh, what little government there is, uh, Haiti would be much better off. Okay, let's take a call of Paul in Maryland. Paul, go ahead. Yes, I have a number of concerns of this discussion. One, uh, in reference to President Narcissus, that's the question that was asked, is his return back to Haiti? I say fine, let him come back to Haiti. But they could also, the Haitian government should have the right to try him on any charges they feel that he has committed crimes while he was there. But there's also been this illusion that people keep putting out that the U.S. government under George Bush was opposed to Aristide, and that's why they took him out. I say to most people, remember the fact that the U.S. government took out Baby Doc, too. Are we going to say that United, uh, the Baby Doc okay. was uh, in odds with the U.S. government when, they, when he was removed? No. Okay. They removed him because they were fearful that the people of Haiti was ready Paul, to remove him. Paul, the can I come in there, Paul? Because there's two minutes left on the program, and you made two very strong points there, actually. So I want to get Harry uh, Fouché to address them in good time. Harry? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the call, Paul. The situation with Aristide's removal in 1991 is totally different from what of Duvalier in 1986. Duvalier has been a dictator for 30 years. Aristide was the first elected president in Haiti. So those are two different, uh, two different things. And as far as uh, also Aristide is concerned, he was overthrown a second time in, on February 29, 2004. So, you know, let's get our facts straight, Paul. Okay. Those are two different matters. Okay, Mark Weisbrot, in about 30 seconds, I'm going to give you the final word here. No, I think that's true. What Harry said is, is very true. Uh, the problem is that uh, you know, the, the overthrow of the Valier was different. That's like in Egypt today where they start to realize that they can't maintain a dictatorship that they've maintained for decades, and so the guy has to go. Uh, Aristide was a completely different phenomenon as a democratically elected president. And that's what they really fear. They are, they are working against democracy in Haiti. That's the real uh, problem. It's still going on. And I do think they're going to have to get used to a new reality, just as in Egypt. They're going to have to get used to the idea that Haitians also have the right to free and fair elections. Okay. Great. I think we'll end it there. Mike, Mark uh, Weisbrot, rather, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, as thank well you. as our guest in Chicago, Harry Fouché, the former Consul General of Haiti in New York and currently thank chairman so of the Consortium yes. for Haitian Empowerment. Fascinating discussion. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And thank you for being with us. Remember, you can follow our program on Twitter. We'll keep you notified on upcoming shows. And you can send us questions and comments to pose to our guests. On the next show, Fighting for Food. 2011 has already set a record for the high prices of basic edibles, exacerbating hunger and poverty in many, many parts of the world. What is driving up the price of food and what are the solutions? Make sure to tune in for that. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.
ਕੀਤਾ ਵਾ 